for the last time, maybe, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the last time, you know, this week or tonight or however however it is. But uh, I, I keep wanting to finish up, and, and uh, but I've I really enjoyed something that's a little unusual as far as my preaching normally goes. I really enjoyed some of these character studies uh, in in uh, Timothy and just looking at some of the individuals that are a reminder to me that God uses and God rewards all believers. God can use and God can reward all believers. Uh, some years ago, um, I was helped a great deal by a message that uh, Dr. Bill Rice III preached at the Bill Rice Ranch. And one of the message uh, was uh, talking about, um, what's, the, what's the fellow's name, Arch uh, Aristarchus. Aristarchus. And uh, just talked about, uh, he, he preached a passage of Scripture in Acts where, of course, Paul was shipwrecked and he had the uh, missionary team around him or the folks that were with him. And it just, in, it just sort of mentions that Aristarchus was there. And one of the things that Dr. Bill pointed out about Aristarchus was that... Uh, he said, you know, you suppose Aristarchus had anybody in his life that was concerned about him. In other words, we think about Paul, Paul being shipwrecked, and we think, oh no. You know, it's the apostle to the Gentiles, and of course he is the one that the, that the Holy Spirit used to pen. Um, really, if, you're, if you just look at his life, you look at what's written about Paul, along with what he wrote, the majority of the New Testament is either about Paul and the way that God used him, in the church. I know Luke was the most prolific writer because he wrote Luke and Acts, but most of Acts is about Paul. And so, uh, you know, you, you look at Paul, he's shipwrecked, and everybody thinks, oh no, you know, Paul's shipwrecked. He's got to get to Rome. We're concerned about Paul. And the question is, what about Aristarchus? You know, he was also shipwrecked. He was with that, with that group of individuals. And we don't, you know, we don't usually think very much about that, but he probably had a father uh, that when, you know, breaking news, ship goes down, uh, Paul's team is uh, shipwrecked. Aristarchus' dad's thinking, hey, I wonder if Aristarchus is okay, and his mom, and his brothers, and his sisters, and so forth. And then as you study in Acts, you look at every time the apostles went somewhere and the Lord mightily used them, you see that they had a team of people that were with them uh, that, you know, oftentimes, sometimes are just, you know, mentioned in passing. And the question is, see, we see things, don't we, in terms of, you know, the great apostle Paul, but we oftentimes don't see things in terms of the great Aristarchus or the great, as we're going to see it in our text this evening, Aquilus and or Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, the, the truth is, is that God doesn't see it that way at all. Matter of fact, there are many instances in the Scripture where we are uh, given to understand that God is the rewarder of all them of them that diligently seek Him. And that's not just when we seek Him for salvation, but it's talking about we, when we seek Him. And so... The question is, what's greatness? What's greatness? Well, you know, in the New Testament, when Jesus was with his apostles, and they, of course, were wanting to be one on the right hand, one on the left, and, and vying over greatness, what did Jesus say about greatness? He said, he'll be great among you, let him be your servant. And if you had to describe some of these individuals that are only mentioned in passing, that's precisely what they were. Well, does God count greatness? Well, he counts serving. And one of the things I want to encourage believers is that... Sometimes we think, well, I'm just the average. I'm just a nobody. I'm just, you know, I'm not anything special. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a preacher, or I'm not a leader, or I'm not a lot of different things. But that isn't actually how God sees it. And so I want to just take a minute this evening and just look at the honorable mention of uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Are you in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Mm -hmm. Well, then please go down with me, and we'll read last week's text as well. And we'll begin in verse 14, read all the way to the end of the text. After we finish reading, we'll pray for the Lord's help with our understanding, and then we'll just get right into uh, this character study tonight. Specifically, we'll be looking at Aquila and Priscilla. Verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Uh, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every work, every evil work, and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. We looked at Onesiphorus a few weeks ago when we saw him in the first chapter of Second Timothy. And then verse 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Troponus, 
have I left at Miletum sick? Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Everybody. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So, Father, please help us this evening with our understanding and our application of the Scripture. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, truthfully, in our context this evening, you know, we, we've moved from dishonorable mention to honorable mention. Last week we looked specifically at Alexander the coppersmith and the fact that he did great evil. Paul called him out by name, marked him, and warned the church about him. Now, I, I will say that this is different than just the nastiness that you see sometimes of brethren toward one another. There's some nastiness on the internet nowadays with some people just... You know, they, they, they call it preaching, but what they do is they just find a brethren and just attack them and just go off. And, they, and so that isn't preaching. Preaching is uh, declaring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's good news. Uh, they, it is necessary sometimes, though, to mark and to warn, isn't it? False teachers. And uh, sometimes it's to be specific about those things. But honestly, especially in the church house, especially in a place where the brethren come together, uh, it's just really not what it's about, is it? We're here to, to hear preaching and to be built up in the faith. Sometimes it's important to know, hey, Alexander the coppersmith will hurt you. Look out. Don't trust the guy. He's not trustworthy. And I'm sure that they had more facts than we do about, the, the, about that. Um, and then Paul mentioned something that you know, we saw as, as a, just a, a, a sad commentary uh, on the believers. You know, there were a lot of believers at Rome. We know that there were Jews and Greeks. If you study the epistle of Paul to Romans, you realize he promised that I'm going to come there. I'm going to see you, and I hope to see you shortly. And we know that when Paul was in Rome, that, that he was visited by the believers in the church at Rome until, until he went before the bench, until uh, jury day, or until he, not jury day, but trial day. And when Paul was in trial, he looked around and... <laughs> Where is everybody? <laughs> I'm here all alone. And we saw some encouraging things about that, but it's a tragic commentary for the believers that no man stood with Paul. And I think that probably that's what leads us into the context of Paul thinking of Aquila and Priscilla. And, uh, of course, um, I think probably a contrast between them and perhaps the believers at Rome. I think, now th this is some speculation, but I think we'll support it when we go to Acts here in just a minute. But I think Paul was thinking if Aquila and Priscilla were here, I would not have stood alone. They were the kind of people that wouldn't have. And I just want to think that probably that's why you know they're mentioned right away when he says salute uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Paul had prayed for the believers that didn't show up. He prayed that God doesn't, don't reward them according to their works. Reward Alexander the coppersmith, but don't reward them according to their works. But then say hello, salute Aquila and Priscilla. And really, to salute is more than just greet. To salute is kind of to give, um, well, it's today's Veterans Day, right? And how many veterans? How many men here are veterans tonight? Frank is, uh, Charlie, Charlie is, and anyone else? Anyone else a veteran here? Well, you know, I, if I had the right to, I'd salute our Veterans Day. I'm not military. I, uh, in, in some ways, regret that I uh, just didn't have time in life to be in the military in our country, but I love uh, what our military stands for and what they've done. I love freedom, and I appreciate our men, and I salute our military today. Amen. In other words, I, uh, I uh, just want to give them the honor that they deserve. And that's sort of the way that Paul is mentioning to uh, about Aquila and Priscilla. He's not just saying greet them, he's saying salute them. Aquila and Priscilla. And the question that that begs in this honorable mention, the dishonorable mention, of course, being Alexander the coppersmith, dishonorable mention uh, being the believers that didn't stand with him at Rome, the honorable mention being Aquila and Priscilla. And the question is, what, what uh, gets them the salute? How'd they get the salute? And so go with me, if you will, please, uh, back to Acts. We'll go back to Acts. And I'd like to uh, go to chapter 18, and we'll just to be introduced. And I know, you know, probably many of us are familiar of Aquila and Priscilla, with Aquila and Priscilla, but most of the time we're reading through Acts. Of course, the narrative isn't about these individuals, is it? In other words, you don't read Acts and think, you know, you know, I can't wait till. Aquila and Priscilla come on the scene, and you know things start really humming in the church, and uh, you know the great things happen. No, you don't really think of that actually at all, do you? Uh, and yet, uh, all in all, Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned in uh, five different scriptures, five different uh, verses in the New Testament, primarily uh, in Acts, but one in Corinthians, and of course 
uh, 1 in 2 Timothy. I should say 6. 6 total. So if you're in Acts chapter 18, I'd just like to look at some things about Aquila and Priscilla that made them worthy of salute. And as, I, as we look at this, my um, thought and our conclusion we're going to arrive at, in case I never clearly stated, I'll just tell you now, is that every one of us, when we look at their lives, ought to conclude and say, you know, I could be that. I could be Aquila, or I could be Pris I could be those people. I could do that. And sometimes you ever look at somebody and just think, I could never do that. And the truth is, they couldn't either if it were not for God's gift and God's grace and, and the, uh, the, uh, even the, the gifting of the Holy Spirit. So they couldn't either. But the reality of it is, is many times we look at each other's lives and we say, you know, I, I never could do that. But yet... Uh, I think there are some folks we look at and say, well, <laughs> I could do that. You ever done that either? You ever paid somebody to do something, and then when you saw them do it, you thought, I could have done that. <laughs> you know, it's just, you say, man, you know, I paid somebody, I could do that. Well, this really fits in that category, and honestly, if God gave us a church full of Aquila and Priscilla, man, I'll tell you something, we could get some things done for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my prayer, and, and the way that I believe we'll conclude our message this evening, would be that every one of us would say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that too. <laughs> but I don't have a car as fast as Brother Duke. So Acts chapter 18. All I got is a Dodge Ram with a Hemi in it. Acts 18. Uh, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Okay, so there's Corinth. Remember Corinth, don't you? And the trouble that, that was there for Paul. And uh, verse 2, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, uh, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and uh, came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Okay, now let's, let's look at this just for a minute. Let's just examine who they are. Okay, they're Jewish. And you say, hey, God's chosen people. Yes, but not Rome's chosen people, evidently. They were told, you can't live. You can't live in Italy. You have to leave. And that, you, that's not lately uh, in our generation. That's not something that's new. Uh, God's people, according to flesh, the Jews, have been persecuted in every age and uh, in every generation. It does not mean that they are believing simply because they're persecuted, but these were believing Jews. And uh, so here's Aquila, and he... And, uh, he lately come from Italy, obviously with his wife Priscilla. And you know, how many instances in the New Testament or Old Testament do you oftentimes see a couple mentioned together? This is what I call a power couple right here. This is a power couple. This is a couple who partners in serving the Lord. In other words, they don't have an individual ministry. They, they just, they're together. You know, you, every time you see Aquila, you see Priscilla. This is really a great partnership. And they're both Jews, and they weren't allowed to live in Italy. And so... You and I may, uh, of course, we know that it's a special thing to be uh, the apple of God's eye. This is what God calls His people, the Jews. And uh, we know it's a special thing, but obviously Rome didn't appreciate it. And so we don't want you in Italy. Get out. Move out. Move away. And so now here they are at Corinth. And um, they're tent makers. They're honestly, the truth is, I don't know particularly the amount of craft or a skill that would have been required in that century, but I can't imagine that it was that they were part of a trade that anyone couldn't work. I think anybody with that's able-bodied could be a tent maker, don't you? And Paul said, uh, you know, he abode with them and rot. Now we talk about tent making now. It's interesting. People think that Paul's trade or Paul's craft was tent making. Actually, it wasn't. That was their craft or their trade, and he lived with them and did what they did. In other words, they, I, it, it appears from the scripture that. He was um, taught tent making, or he worked for them. They gave him a job. They employed him. Okay, now, what's special about that? Well, nothing much. That's all the Bible says about it. In other words, when Paul went to Corinth, he had a, uh, he had a place to stay, and the place he had to stay was with these people that gave him a job making tents. Now, if you're a tent maker, could you hire the Apostle Paul and let him stay with you? Could you do that? Let's say it together. I could do that. Ready? I could do that. And you really could, couldn't you? I mean, honestly. You know, you know, we talk about tent making as a trade. Everyone here this evening, I think, works. Every one of us could, uh, in a sense, work with someone or be a blessing to someone in that way, particularly if 
we uh, have our own business, which apparently they did. They were enterprising. They had a house, they had a home, and they opened up their home. Paul was able to stay with them. It gave him a base for his ministry, and he was able to work for them, and it gave him a means for support. I could do that, right? That's, that's nothing special, is it? Here they are mentioned, and it's interesting because everywhere Paul went, don't you think he stayed somewhere? Don't you think everywhere Paul went, you know, he most likely stayed somewhere? And sometimes we know about where he stayed, but other times we don't know where he stayed. It's not always mentioned. And we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. So what's the profit in this passage of Scripture this evening? I think it's pretty easy for us uh, when we look at the overview and we look at the lives and the examples of Aquila and Priscilla. I think that it's pretty obvious for us to say, you know what, Aquila and Priscilla, they were good people that opened up their home. They opened up their home to Paul and gave him a base. And they helped Paul have a craft or a trade. And uh, so they gave him a means... Uh, for support or income. You know, it seems like they probably weren't wealthy enough to just say, okay, Paul, you can stay with us and we'll give you money. They, they, they didn't have that full means, but they had a craft. They said, well, Paul, you can stay with us and if you help make tents, you know, you can get paid for that. I can do that. I can do that. Can you? Sure, we can. I find that to be rather encouraging, don't you? Uh, and so uh, we see here that they were hospitable and they did what they could. Okay, so in Acts 18 first couple verses we see Aquila and Priscilla are hospitable and they did what they could. You could be hospitable and you could do what you can. Right? Okay, now uh, let's go down a little further in the same chapter of the scripture and they're mentioned again. Um, let's see, verse 18. Uh, and Paul after this tarried there, this is speaking of uh, when when uh, he had been in Achaia uh, um in verse 18, Paul after this tarried there a good while and then took leave of his brethren and sailed thence into Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila having shorn his head in Centria for he had a vow. Okay, so Paul is traveling and Paul leaves and when he leaves, there's some people, they got kicked out of Italy, they're fairly mobile. They have a profession where you pretty much could, you know, make a tent anywhere. As long as you have materials and supplies, they could do that anywhere. And so now when Paul leaves, Aquila and Priscilla uh, go with him. Now, what would you call this, they're traveling with him? I'd call it companions, right? They're companions or friends to Paul. Um, I'm certain that they probably went at their own expense. I don't think Paul raised support for them and took his team, team Aquila and Priscilla. No, they... They could make tents, and they were used to getting kicked out of places and being a little bit transient and mobile, moving from place to place. And so now Paul is traveling, and guess who's traveling with him? Aquila and Priscilla. Now, are they doing all the teaching and preaching? Well, not yet. Not really. I mean, they're just traveling with Paul. You know how important it is to have other believers to partner with in ministry? Uh, it just makes all the difference in the world. You know, I'm a church planter. We've done church planting. We're working on Miami Beach, and it's been a slow go in Miami Beach. We've got more help right now than we've ever had in Miami Beach, but it's been a slow go because we just haven't had much help in Miami Beach. If we had more help, the, the church would go faster. It would grow more quickly down there. And you know what really got us off the ground in Fort Lauderdale? We had three single people that moved to Fort Lauderdale when we started our church, and uh, they just got jobs and just plugged in, and they were just part of the ministry. And anything that needed to be done, they were willing to do. But I'll tell you the most valuable, most important thing any of them did, and that was just being here. It's just kind of uh, discouraging to try to preach to nobody and to try to minister to nobody. And just having some warm bodies and some willing people that were companions and partners in the ministry is a big deal. And you know something? You could be a companion and a partner in the ministry, couldn't you? You could just get involved in it in the ministry, and you could do that. And I, I look at Aquila and Priscilla traveling with the Apostle Paul, and I think I could do that. Could you? That's a real help. So they're hospitable, and they did what they could. They were partners in the ministry, and they got involved. And you could do that. Uh, look at verse uh, 24. Now, here we've gone to Antioch, and then uh, 
all over the country, Galatia and uh, Phrygia. Verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, if we stop and we were to examine and look at the life and ministry of Apollos, we would have to say that in the New Testament of the Scripture, probably Apollos would have been the most polished and uh, probably most effective speaker of anyone in the New Testament, including Paul himself. We could say not probably, but for certainty, Apollos was far more popular than anyone else, any of the other apostles. Paul was very unpopular. And it's incredible, actually, how alone Paul was, in spite of how greatly God used him, how very alone he actually was. You know, we think about Paul. He was the most effectively used apostle. No question about that. But in his day, he was the least popular of all the apostles. And that's a fact. Just study it sometime. It'll blow your mind. This is always, it's really an incredible truth to me. But Apollos would have been the opposite. Apollos, man, fervent. Fervent. I mean, you know, you kind of get the idea when you talk about fervor, you know, feverish or excited. He had, he had zeal and enthusiasm, and he was eloquent. Man, he could explain things, and when he finished explaining them, the lights went on. I mean, people understood like they never understood before. And everywhere Apollos went, he taught the Scripture. He, was, he understood the Scripture. He was effective in it. The only problem was he didn't know. He didn't know that Jesus' work on the cross was finished. He didn't know it was completed. And so in spite of his fervor and effectiveness, uh, he didn't, wasn't preaching the full gospel. I'm not saying it wasn't the gospel. People that believed in the baptism of John, what was it? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So who's, what was the kingdom of heaven? Well, it was Jesus. So John preached Jesus, no question about that, but he didn't know about the completed work of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. He didn't have his facts. And so here's Apollos, who's so effective, such a great teacher, such a powerful uh, Bible teacher, and uh, fervent in spirit, diligent. All these words describe him. In verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. There he is out, and he's just preaching away and speaking and affecting people publicly. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took on him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. That's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that incredible? I mean, what are you going to teach Apollos, really? Who is going to teach a guy like Apollos? I mean, if I heard Apollos speak, I'd say, say on. <laughs> I don't have anything to say. You know, when somebody's evidently way better at what they do uh, than, what, than you are, it's just like, well, go right ahead. Go ahead and do it. I'll take a back seat to this. But Aquila and Priscilla realize, okay, this man has everything except for all the facts. And they took him aside and they taught him and the way of God more perfectly. And in verse 28, the result was he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the Scripture that, was, that Jesus was Christ. Whoa, wait a second. Here's a guy who's fervent, who's diligent, who uh, is well-spoken, who's bold, all these things. But he doesn't, the, the, he doesn't have the power doesn't have the force behind his teaching. He's well-meaning, but he just doesn't have it. And guess who taught him? Guess who gave him that boost? Aquila and Priscilla. And so here they are, boosters. <laughs> okay. uh, literally, they, they just gave him a step up. Let me, let me help you a little bit. They expounded the Word of God more perfectly to him, and whammo! Now Apollos is everything more than he was before. They were encouragers. They were boosters. They, they, they uh, helped complete. Just, just help come alongside. They're not coming in. You know, Apollos, you're worthless. You know, you're, you, know you're, you mean well, but you're not. No, they just came alongside and took him to the next level. It's interesting, actually, that they're even mentioned in this context, isn't it? I mean, couldn't we just have been introduced to Apollos? Apollos, you know, a guy who had a great ministry, and then when he understood the... Uh, the, the complete uh, cross, uh, the grave, and the resurrection, now all of a sudden he's effective. Why do you even need to mention Aquila and Priscilla here? 
Well, I think it sort of can be an encouragement to us because the truth matters. Any one of us can help somebody with something. You ever meet someone it seems like they've got a lot of ability? It seems like they're in the right place, but it seems like there are just some things missing. You know, some believers would go and just say, you know, you're just all wrong about everything. You need to quit. You know, right being there doing that. Other ones would come alongside and say, you know, um, this is this is fantastic what you're doing. Did you know this? And do it in such a harmless, helpful way that somebody say, no, I didn't. Well, that's good. That'll really help. And now all of a sudden, Apollos is this orator, this effective preacher who's compared with Paul and Peter with the believers at Corinth. And that's amazing, isn't it? Aquila and Priscilla were encouragers. They were boosters. They helped take Paul, or not just Paul, but uh, Apollos to the next level. I can do that. Could you do that? Sure. You say, Pastor, I don't know that much. Well, it might be that you know something somebody doesn't. You know, you know more Bible truth than any lost person. I remember being in Bible college, preparing for the ministry, and being scared to death that when I got in the ministry, I just wouldn't have answers for people's questions. And do you know that my experience in the ministry is that people don't have questions that I haven't had? Generally, I mean, I've just always been able to have answers for people's questions, except for one lady who is just out of her mind. I mean, literally, she could ask questions in the, in the first uh, church we were ever at. Uh, she, I mean, honestly, she, she was a um, psychiatrist, and she had serious, serious mental issues, which all psychiatrists actually do. My apologies if you're a psychiatrist here this evening. That's an insult, and uh, it wasn't nice, so I apologize for that. But I've never met a psychiatrist that hadn't been to one before they became one. And so, um, is, it, is that true? Does anybody know an exception to that? I don't think there's an exception. It is true? It is true. It is true. Brother, hey, doctor, doctor. Waldron <laughs> concurs. But it is it is sad, but it is actually true. This lady could ask me questions, and they were so off the wall, I didn't even know where to start answering them. I was just like, I don't even understand the question, far less the answer. But the truth of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, they knew the gospel, and they knew it, it, it simply, they knew it clearly, and they could share it. I could do that, couldn't you? Isn't that wonderful? You could be an Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, so could I. Um, Romans. Romans chapter 16. This is the end of the letter to the church at Rome. This one is, this one's wonderful. Romans chapter 16. Are you there? Um, I just want to read uh, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Now they're not they're not traveling with the preeminent missionary at this time. They're not traveling with the Apostle Paul who, you know, has established churches all across the world. They're not traveling with him anymore. But uh, when Paul writes the letter to Rome, evidently, where are Priscilla and Aquila? Well, they're uh, evidently in, in Rome. And uh, look at verse 4. Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Well, that is quite a bit of information, isn't it? Now, when Paul first met them, they were refugees or fugitives from Italy. They were living in Corinth, and they were just trying to make a living making tents. After a while, when Paul traveled, they traveled with him, and they were companions and encouragers. Then, when they had the opportunity, they met Apollos, and they were teachers. And they were teaching Apollos and taking him to the next level, encouraging him to take the next important step in the ministry. And now they're at Rome. I mean, these folks are everywhere. Now they are at Rome, and um, Paul said they have... For my life laid down their own necks. I'd like to know details, wouldn't you? I'd like to know what he's talking about, but I mean, when Paul says it, I can just feel, I can feel the emotion with which he is having this written. I mean, he's saying these people literally, they laid down their own necks. And you wonder why Paul, when he said, 
No one stood with me. You wonder why he, right away he mentions Aquila and Priscilla. He's thinking they were still here. They, they'd have been here. They, they wouldn't have been worried about their own peril. Or their own. So, so what can we say about them? Well, we could say they're sacrificial or we could say they were selfless. We could say that they saw that there was a cause bigger than themselves. The fact of the matter is that until a person is actually called upon to do so, the whole sacrificing yourself for someone else is a little bit of a hypothetical. But I do believe that everything is in a determination, a, determin a determining factor. For instance, could we say here this evening that every husband that loves his wife, we don't have to question whether or not they'd sacrifice themselves for their wives. Those wives don't have to say, well, honey, go out and you know, get run over by a car just so I know. Like, if you know your husband loves you, you know, right? In other words, you don't have to be tested necessarily for us to know that you would do what God tells you to do. If you're everything God wants you to be, you could make that commitment. And though you have not perhaps risked yourself or done so, uh, we could safely say that a real man would, couldn't we? A good man would? Okay. Well, then, could you just commit that for the cause of Christ, if, if God needed you. The question is, could I sacrifice myself? Would I sacrifice myself? Well, that's an important question for every one of us to answer. When it comes, first of all, for loving the brethren and for being willing to just give God everything in your life, a surrendered Christian would sacrifice themselves for whatever they felt God wanted, right? And evidently, Aquila and Priscilla felt as though the risk, their own peril, was God's calling for them, for Paul's sake. In other words, they evidently had clarity that they were supposed to risk themselves for Paul. And did so. That's a tough one. We're here saying, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. But could we say this evening that a surrendered Christian could say, I could do that? Because when you surrender, you say, God, not my will, but thine. I'll do anything. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. Though you may not have made the sacrifice, the willingness to make the sacrifice in God's eyes is the same thing. And you know, Christian, tragically, there are believers who count their lives too dear. And this is an area where there is some separation between Aquila and Priscilla and just hospitable people, companionable people, helpful people, teaching people. Honestly, this here is where Aquila and Priscilla kind of go, they, they take the next level. But there isn't anything about that that I wouldn't think God would be pleased to see in every one of us. Isn't it so? Because we're not talking about what they did, we're talking about the willingness to do it. That's really what it's all about. I mean, the fact that someone's willing, they evidently, are, they survived risking their lives, right? So they survived, so they didn't give their lives but they evidently were willing to. Could you be willing to give your life for the cause of Christ? Could you? I could do that. Anyone could do that, right? To be you know, this great teacher, this great preacher. Or, you know, you don't have to have uh, qualities or talents or abilities. You just, you could just say, God, anything you want from me, I'll give it. I'll do it. Willingness to sacrifice. Um, verse. Uh, five. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Huh. Well, that's a little extra, isn't it? It's a little extra, isn't it? Now, Quill and Priscilla evidently have an established place. They have a location in Rome. The church at this point, at this juncture, obviously in Rome, there aren't a lot of synagogues. There are, though there would be some. But the church isn't really welcome to meet in the synagogues much anymore. And so Will and Priscilla have opened up their home. And they said, you know what, our home, our uh, Mikasa is Sukasa, or my home is God's home. Well, so they, just, they just gave their home to the Lord. I can do that. I can do that, could you? All of us could say, I could do that. And now there's a church there. I think they're probably a pretty pretty large part of it. Uh, well, we have some dear friends in Tennessee, and a number of them a couple of years ago started a church. And one of the neat things about their church plant was they needed a location. And I, uh, a family that was part of the church just opened up their home. It's the Berkey family. And uh, 
they have a uh, on their property they have well they had a shed built big barn and uh, had a second not a huge barn but you know a decent size and had a second floor in it first floor and they just kind of set that up for church meeting and then they opened up their garage and their uh, living room and their kitchen and just spaces all around their property and uh, the church met there for the first couple of years and really grew up to you know being around I think grew about a hundred in that location really did well there and uh, they just opened up their home and you know, it was a lot of work because before all the cars started rolling in and everybody met there you know the Waldron you have folks are having church in your home it's work isn't it getting your home prepared to open to visitors and then just having people strangers walking in your house strangers coming in and out of your place and everybody's invited you know and uh, you know, it's a little, but you know anybody could do that. If your home was the Lord's home, they had a home that was dedicated to God. Their home was dedicated to God. That's what we could say here, couldn't we? Their home was dedicated to the Lord. That takes a lot. Honestly, it takes a lot to say my home is open to God using it. But we could all do that. And Aquila and Priscilla did. I could do that. One more thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, one book over. And uh, if you go down toward the end of the chapter, and uh, this, of course, this would probably be when Paul's living in their house and in Corinth. Or, uh, no, it, it wouldn't be. He's writing back to them but it, Paul had lived in their house when they were in Corinth. Verse 19, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah, the churches in Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, just easily reading into that phrase or that statement, what you find is that they evidently in their time at Corinth and invested themselves in the folks that became believers. I'm thinking specifically of Crispus and uh, Gaius and uh, the different individuals that are in this church. And now they've moved on. Now there's a church in their house evidently somewhere else in Rome. And um, I'm sorry, not, not, that's wrong, not in Rome. Uh, but F, where is it? Ephesus. Is it Ephesus? Okay. Uh, now they're somewhere else, but they're writing back to a place where they've been before. And when Paul said Aquila and Priscilla, you know, Aquila and Priscilla say hi. No, they said they salute you much in the Lord. And here you find their encouragers to all the church in Corinth. I mean, they're right. Man, tell them, tell them we're praying for them. Tell them we love them. Tell them we miss them. Tell them, tell them we salute them in the Lord. And you see the emphasis here, how much more emphatic this is. And uh, all in all, as you look at these individuals, you know, they're, they're mentioned, they have an honorable mention after a dishonorable mention in Paul's letter to Timothy. But when we look at these individuals in their life, it's, it's very, very easy to see how Quill and Priscilla are dear, dear, beloved brethren, aren't they? I mean, they are just... Uh, what could you want more from a believer than an Aquila and Priscilla? I mean, give us Aquila and Priscilla in our church. Wouldn't it be fantastic? How many of you like to have Aquila and Priscilla in the church? Wouldn't that encourage you? I mean, they'd serve you. They'd do what they could. They'd be hospitable. They'd help you take the next step. Um, and then they just love you. I mean, it's just evident from 1 Corinthians 16, that they just loved the brethren. Who doesn't like to be loved? Who isn't impacted by people saying, man, I just love those people. I just love them. And that's Aquila and Priscilla. And so they're an honorable mention in Paul's letter, letter to Timothy. And when I look at their life and just do a little bit of a study, say, well, you know, why do they get mentioned out of everybody? You know, why Aquila and Priscilla in an eternal book? How'd they get their name, like, you know, in the Hall of Fame? I mean, literally, they're just, they're, they're listed forever in a good way in the eternal Word of God. How'd that happen? Well, anybody could do that. 
Anybody could. And I find that to be vastly encouraging. You know, it doesn't really matter much if we're ever known by anybody but God, does it? But I'll tell you something. God knew Aquila and Priscilla, no question about it. And the believers knew them. They weren't famous. You didn't, they weren't the first people you think. You don't think, oh, I'm going to read Acts. I can't wait to get to Aquila and Priscilla and see the amazing things they accomplished. No, they, to me, they're just plotters. They're just people that when they see the truth of God's Word, they just say, yes, yes, that's right. Yes, Lord, I'll do that. And they just did whatever they, sh they ought to have done. And you could do that too. God didn't call you to be Aquila. God didn't call you to be Priscilla. But God called you to be the person that's sitting in your seat. And uh, every instance when God speaks to you or gives you an opportunity to serve or to be used is an opportunity that you could do what you're supposed to and you could please God every bit as much. And you could be a blessing to all believers. And uh, the truth is, is you could be the kind of person that uh, when your name is mentioned, it warms the heart of those that you've been a blessing to. And when, you, uh, and when someone else is mentioned, you could write warmly about the love that you have for others in your heart. Man, God give us some people that just say, I could do that, just like Aquila and Priscilla. God, thank you for what we've learned this evening. Please help us to absorb it and to, God, just make it a part of our way of thinking and our natural response. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks for your attention tonight. You're dismissed.